and start this. Okay, and I just want to adjust one thing so I can at least see some people while I'm presenting. I'm not just talking to a blank computer. <clears throat> so good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Um, it's great that spring is here, even though it's been a little chilly the last few mornings, but um, the sunshine is, has really been great. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk about Maine's mysterious marsh birds. And I'm kind of our water bird specialist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And so these birds I'm gonna talk about tonight are birds that I kind of um, deal with across the state. So we try to understand their populations and know where they're at. A lot of them are rare. So understanding where they are, which habitats they're using so we can better protect them. Um, I also work with um, other birds, colonial water birds. Um, so like great blue herons, um, the egrets and ibis and those um, birds, as well as black terns, which is a marsh nesting tern species and the common loon um, in Maine. So a lot of different birds, but the common thread is they all use wetlands to some degree. All right, so, um, I worry that that little toolbar keeps coming down and blocking some of the slide, um, but I, I don't think it's because I'm doing anything. So I don't know if it's every time somebody comes in, it happens. Um, so tonight, so this is just an overview. We're gonna talk about what it means to be a secretive marsh bird, why they're called that, uh, the habitats that they are found in, then some species specific information, um, how we're surveying for them and how you could even get involved in that kind of, those kind of surveys. Um, and then we're going to have a fun little quiz at the end where we might even have some prizes for you. Um, so why do we call these birds secretive? Well, secretive marsh birds is actually almost a technical phrase now. It's kind of, it describes this guild of birds that are very well camouflaged, like you can see here with the American bittern standing in the reeds. Um, they're also very secretive in that they, they they're most of the time are not seen flying. So they are kind of hiding out in the vegetation of these marshes. And the only way you know they're there is maybe by hearing their call. Um, some of their habitats that they're, they're inhabiting are secretive or elusive in the sense that they're hard to get to, or at least for um, you know, most of us who don't want to slog through a wetland and go up to our neck and muck just to get there. So um, some of them are inhabiting places that are just hard to get to and therefore hard for us to find these birds. They, I mentioned they often don't, um, you know, they're not seen flying very often. They're mostly um, running through the vegetation. Um, like you can see this Virginia rail there, uh, at least just the backside of it. Um, their nests are also very well camouflaged in that vegetation. There's actually a um, Virginia rail nest right in this photo, but you would never know it's there until you stumble upon it. And what are the chances you're gonna do that because it's in the middle of a wetland? So, <clears throat> so who are these species? Um, we are gonna, focus on, we have nine focal species that we target with our marsh bird surveys. And those are the Virginia rail, the Sora, the American common gallinule, pie-billed grebe, American bittern, least bittern, green heron, and sedren. And then a couple others I'll mention tonight because of similarities, or they're also found in these habitats, or we also want to know where they are in the state. I, I'll mention the marsh wren, the Wilson snipe, the yellow rail, the great blue heron, and the black tern. So where do they live? So most of the, when I talk about a marsh, I'm, I really mean, you know, kind of like a, a flooded area, semi-permanently flooded. So it's wet most of the time. It only dries out in maybe the driest of years. Um, there's enough water and changing water levels that actually support specific vegetation that keeps its roots wet in that saturated soil, but also has a lot of vegetation coming up above the water. And we call that emergent vegetation. Um, 
It can be tidal or it can be freshwater. Some of these birds can be found in both types of habitats. <clears throat> And it can be shrubby. So um, some of them prefer to be kind of, you know, put their nest right at the base of a shrub um, that's on the edge of maybe a more emergent wetland. They might live in large wetland complexes, or they might be in small isolated patches. And they could be right in your backyard or a neighborhood park, um, or it might be, you know, in a pretty isolated bog up in northern Maine. The thing about these wetlands, you know, we've known that we've had a serious loss of wetland habitat, especially emergent wetland habitat over the last um, 50 years or century. So, you know, that makes um, these birds even more um, difficult in some ways to understand because by losing some of their habitat, we could be also losing some of these birds. Um, so it's really important to try to understand you know, what's going on with their populations. Um, some of the threats that they face, you know, even here in Maine are invasive species like purple loosestrife, um, shoreline development affecting the water quality, which then affects, you know, what they're feeding on and then their health. So um, the, with the, where these birds do live probably indicates a pretty high quality marsh, which is a good thing. So how do we find these birds? Um, this is a video I just wanna share, and this is so typical of what you might see in the field when you're looking for one of these species. And um, this species you're gonna hear and kind of see, it's a little grainy, is a least bittern. So this is a lucky day that we actually can see something moving around in there. Um, a lot of times you might only hear that call that we heard at the beginning and not see a bird moving around. Um, granted, this is a grainy video, but it just gives you a feel for what it's like to be out there in a cattail stand um, trying to listen for or see one of these birds. Okay, let's get out of this slide. There we go. So what, one of the best ways, um, I, like I said, the best way to detect these birds is to hear them call. Um, and when we go out to survey for them, instead of just waiting around and seeing if they're gonna call to us, we actually use um, like an MP3 player or this picture here on the right shows uh, what we call a game caller where we play their recordings and listen for them to call back. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty effective way. It, it even has its limitations because there's certain times of the season, they might not be as willing to call back. You know, they're not feeling territorial at that time, but it's, it's really our best tool um, to try to detect where they are. So now I'll get into some of the species. And um, because of that reason, you know, that the best way to detect them is hearing them. I'm gonna be playing their calls um, kind of after each species so that you can hear the variety and what they might sound like. Maybe some will stick with you. Maybe you know some of them already, um, but there is a quiz at the end. So pay attention <laughs> um, and maybe you'll, you'll actually be a winner. <laughs> But um, so we'll start with the rails. On the left here is the Sora, and on the right is the Virginia rail. And these guys are, um, they tend to be small birds with short tails, stubby wings. They're most often considered weak flyers when they're flushed. Um, they're pretty cryptic in coloration. Um, one of their adaptations is they have these compressed bodies, so they're laterally compressed, so it actually allows them to walk through that vegetation pretty easily, and they'll step one foot in front of the other. And in some of the photos of the rails, you might notice their toes are really long, and that almost acts kind of like a snowshoe, but this is more like a mud shoe. Um, it helps them to stay up on um, the floating vegetation or the saturated mud and not sink down. 
<clears throat> they eat anything, they eat um, aquatic invertebrates and they also will eat some vegetation matter, plant matter. Um, but it depends on, you can see here, they both have different bills. So the Sora has a stubby bill. That's kind of more designed for picking, you know, seeds, but they'll also eat some spiders and things like that. And then the Virginia rail has a more um, probing bill, you know, long and narrow and decurved. That's better for probing the soil to get more invertebrates. <clears throat> like a lot of these birds, they're most active at dawn or dusk. Uh, what we call crepuscular. And that's when we end up doing our surveys is basically at the crack of dawn or um, late in the evening as the sun would be setting. <clears throat> so this is the Virginia rail. Um, these guys, like I said, they use that bill to probe for invertebrates. They like shallow water with robust emergent vegetation. Um, and then um, they'll even inhabit the coastal marshes. I'll play a series of their calls. There's um, three different ones. The ticket call is mostly used by the males during courtship. Um, and then you'll hear a grunt, which I very often feel like it's somebody laughing at me. Um, and that's used for more pair communication, sometimes territorial defense. And then the kicker call, uh, they think might be like unpaired females soliciting males. Um, so I'll go ahead and play those. You can have a listen. Okay, have those memorized? <laughs> We're gonna hear more. <laughs> uh, the next one is the Sora. Um, like I showed you before, it has a different shaped bill, eats a little more vegetation than invertebrates. Um, both, both rails and rails in general, they um, actually have asynchronous hatching, which means there could be as much as um, almost two weeks between the first egg hatching and the last egg. And that, um, they also, in order to accommodate those young that have hatched, they'll actually build nursery nests um, through the marsh. So these guys, they'll build their nest out of that, but whatever vegetation is nearby, it's usually well hidden, like I showed you before, um, but they might also have nursery nests. The chicks are black downy, like you see there, um, and they can pretty much get up on their own um, within a few days and they're out and about, and they can even swim pretty pretty soon after hatching. So with the Sora, um, the, the call that you're going to hear, the Kirwi call, or sometimes it actually, I think of it as saying Sora, but um, with a high-pitched sound, that's given alone or preceding the Winnie call, which is the most common, commonly heard call that you'll hear. Um, so I'll play those, and you can put those to memory. So one thing I'll mention, you know, at the end of that series, you just heard those one note calls. All of these birds also have these like individual one note calls as well um, that can sometimes tri trip you up, you know, and, and sometimes it might actually sound close to a frog call. And I'll play some towards the end that might sound like a frog call, but just keep that in mind. Sometimes you don't hear the whole call as you learn it from Sibley's guide uh, you might just hear a part of it. And so that just takes a lot of time to get familiar with the calls and to, to recognize those little portions of them. 
So here are those two rails, Virginia Rail and Sora. I went through and um, looked on the Bird Atlas um, map, interactive map in eBird to um, see what we know so far from our Bird Atlas results. And it's interesting to me to see that, you know, Virginia Rail is definitely more abundant and a little more widespread than the Sora is so far based on our results. So hopefully, you know, we'll be adding to these results. We have this year is the last year um, to be able to contribute to that part of it. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of work that everybody's doing this year to try to bump up and get a little more dark purple on both of these maps. And that is a typical looking rail nest that you can see just looking straight down into it. You can see a lot of that vegetation is probably cattails that it's built out of. And that's the first chick that hatched. So the other reel I want to mention um, is one that's, you know, it's really not confirmed as a breeder here. We've had um, several locations where they've been heard calling um, throughout the state over the years, um, but we think that maybe we're just hearing them um, as they move through the state. So, so far with um, the bird atlas results, we do have one possible location where they're hurt. I think the call was heard maybe in July, and I think Doug Hitchcock was part of that observation. Um, so, and it's, it's an easy one in some ways to recognize the call. So it, I thought it would be worth playing it here in case you are out in marshes and you were to hear it. Um, so these guys tend to inhabit a little different type of marsh. It's considered a sedge meadow habitat versus um, what you think of the more uh, cattail and sedges and rushes in the other marshes along with the shrubby component. So the call that the yellow rail um, has is a five note uh, kind of tapping. So it sounds like tapping two stones together. Um, and it seems like you could easily mimic it. Oop. What happened there? One second. Let's see if it'll play. There we go. So that doesn't even really sound like a bird, if you ask me, but it's definitely something to recognize. Okay, so also in the rail family, we have the gallinule. It used to be called the common moorhen. Um, these guys, even though they're in the rail family, they kind of start look, acting a little more like a duck in the sense that you might see them more swimming in the open water, like that one photo in the upper right. Um, in Maine, they're considered a threatened species because we have such a low population and very few occupied sites. Um, they like pretty robust emergent vegetation a lot of times um, and the hemi marsh condition. So that's something I didn't really touch on, but that's where you have pockets of open water um, interspersed with all the emergent vegetation. So it's kind of this mosaic that gives the birds lots of places to hide and be hidden, but also accessing different spots and food and so forth. Um, so the vocalizations of this guy or girl um, will include a slowing series of clucks that ends in a distinctive long whining note. And we're gonna hear the coot as well um, in a couple slides. The gallinule tends to be a little higher pitched than the coot, but it, kind of, I think it's a funny um, series of calls to hear. Enough out of you. <laughs> um, so this is a typical nesting habitat. You can see there is a gallinule um, in this photo here. 
you know, a nice cattail marsh, some open water for it to swim around in, but then also can go into these little uh, rivulets of water interspersed with, with that vegetation. Um, and this is what um, their nests look like. It's basically a glorified rail nest. So same kind of structure, just a little bigger, um, but also well hidden in the vegetation. And you can see on this map, um, we've got you know a handful of observations, not much in the way of confirmed breeding so far. We've got one site, uh, we've got a, you know a couple, couple possible sites. So, um, but this is what I kind of expected. This is kind of the extent of our knowledge thus far, um, as far as gallinules go in the state. But you know, hoping to find some more spots that they're hiding out. So this is a great picture to show you what a gallinule and a coot look like side by side. Um, the gallinules are a little smaller than the American coot. Um, and the American coot is definitely leans a little more duck-like. So gallinules are a little more towards ducks from rails. And then you have the coot, which gets even more as far as their, their habits and, and the fact that they are out in the open water a little bit. So you can see um, here, like I mentioned, um, they're, you know, they're often seen a little more out in the open water. Um, these guys will actually, they eat primarily vegetative material and they'll actually dive down a couple of feet to get it. So that's very different than the rest of the rails that I've spoken about so far. And they have these, their toes are different also. They're almost webbed, like uh, more like a duck would be which allows them to do that, that diving. And then you can see the young on, on the upper right. So these guys do not have the, the cutest young, but um, the, the uglier, the better, because the more um, that red frontal shield there, that bear shield, the redder it is, and the, the spikier those um, feathers are, the more often they get fed, which is interesting. But um, so these guys are, um, kind of similar to the gallinule with their vocaliz vocalizations, a lot of grunting and croaking and squawking. There must be a slight delay in some of my calls loading. <laughs> They'll build uh, these nests in the, you know, right on the edge of like the virgin marsh habitat, but near the open water that are kind of like a platform nest. You've maybe seen loon nests. It's, it almost reminds me of that. Um, and so you can see on this map, again, from the, the bird atlas results, you know, not a lot of sites. There's been some ob observations. I'd be curious to, to see when some of those observations were and whether or not we can get out there uh, even this year to see if we can um, see them again and make those more possible breeding records. Okay, so moving on to the pie-billed grebe. This is one of my favorites because um, they're, they're just such an interesting bird. There's so much you could talk about with them. So they've got this bill that gets almost light blue, uh, bluish white during breeding, and it has that black stripe. And it's kind of, as you'll notice, compared to other grebes, it's a short, stout bill. And that, you know, is related to what it feeds on. So it goes after aquatic invertebrates, it would eat um, crayfish, it'll eat fish, it'll um, kind of use its bill to kind of crush the bones in the fish before it actually gulps it down. Um, these guys have a lot of similarities to loons in the sense that they have dense bones and they can um, easily submerge themselves in the water kind of like a loon does when they're kind of sneaking away or um, they also, their legs are far back on their body just like a loon. So that gives them the ability to swim really well but they're also awkward on land. Um, and they have, you know, webbed toes more so than, than the coots webbing. Um, let's see. And 
I can play their calls. It's um, a series of kind of gulping, um, far reaching calls. So these calls you can hear sometimes on neighboring wetlands or a neighboring pond, you know, depending on how far away you are, it has three distinct components of whoop or what and quok or quok notes um, and cacao notes. So I'll just stop saying all those sounds and just let you listen to it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> So they will also build a nest um, that's very similar to what I think of as a loon nest, kind of this built up platform with made from mud and vegetation from the surroundings, but up against the, the vegetation. It needs, you know, some something to hide behind for the most part. Their young are really interesting looking. They have these kind of zebra stripes on their faces. Sometimes they'll even um, have young on their back, similar to a loon, uh, but um, really, really neat birds to be able to see uh, in the wetland. And they like the, that hemi marsh, that half open water, half vegetated wetland again. And so this map, you know, just showing that we do have quite a few confirmed breeding, but I would almost expect to hear or to see more than what's on here. Um, maybe it's just that I tend to gravitate towards wetlands and I tend to see these guys more often, but I would think they'd be a little more numerous. So now we're getting into the bitterns and herons. And um, this, there's a great blue heron on the left there and an American bittern on the right. And one of the cool things about these guys is their ability to strike at their prey. Um, and what gives them that ability is they have a modified cervical vertebrae that makes their spine kind of do this crazy kink right here and then go in front of its esophagus. And so that allows them, it kind of allows them to coil back and strike at their prey. So just kind of an interesting little tidbit about bitterns and herons in general. Um, so I'll first talk about the American bittern. These guys, one of their nicknames is the Thunder Pumper because of their call. Another really unique call that um, is very recognizable when you're out in wetlands. The, I wish I had a good video. I tried to put a video in here showing the adult calling and because uh, they do this elaborate, you know, they, it's a very um, physical call. They gulp in air to make their call. Um, and it's just really remarkable to see. But um, so here in this picture, there's actually what I think is an adult here because we have a dark mustache on it. And then this one, I'm pretty sure might be, it might be a juvenile, although you can see a little darkness there. Um, the males and females do look alike. This could be a male getting ready to do its call and do a display because these white feathers are kind of showing on its, on its shoulders. But one of the things that bitterns are really good at is camouflage. So they like to stick their heads straight up like this. And it's almost as if they're pretending to be like the vegetation around them and saying, you can't see me, you know, and they have these eyes that can actually look down while their head is pointed up, um, which allows them to still watch for prey. So really cool um, adaptations that they have. And here's, you know, just another picture showing uh, the bittern stance, as they call it. Um, they like these dense um, emergent habitats. Again, you know, cattail stands, um, other uh, emergent vegetation. This is a, a nest on the right here with some, some young. And then let's see, I think the next slide will be the calls. So um, it's a, the, Pneumatic, is that what they say? Is the unka chunk um, is kind of what it's supposed to sound like. And this is why they're called the thunder pumper. Mm -hmm. 
And so they are like most herons and bitterns, they also have that have the ability to do a squawk, right? So so many of those species can also um, they also do a squawk. And a lot of times that's emitted when they flush from somewhere. Um, but that's you know, that's not their typical call for like attracting a mate or so forth. So so looking at where we've seen uh, bitterns, you know, they're pretty widespread. Um, and, and I often say that most wetlands um, probably have bitterns, um, or at least large enough wetlands to support them. Um, I do think they're pretty common and widespread in the state. So this map makes sense to me. Okay, now onto the least bittern, which is least means little um, or littler. And this one is the smallest of the heron family. So I think it's about maybe a third the size of the American bittern, so pretty small. These pictures, you know, they make them seem so big to me. Um, and, but when you see them in the field, it's just remarkable how small they are. Um, so these guys are really neat birds too. They, they have the ability, I'll show you another picture here, where they have those big toes um, and they actually use them to grasp the vegetation and that's how they kind of move through it. Like you can see those young on the, on the right doing that. Um, but they often don't fly like you see here. They're, they're moving through that vegetation, sometimes burrowing down, especially when they're disturbed. Um, they don't necessarily show themselves. They will build little platform nests and a lot of these birds can actually have the ability to adjust to wa fluctuating water levels where they can build their nest up throughout the season and raise up their eggs um, to avoid flooding, which is um, a great adaptation that they have. But they also build canopies too over their nests with the vegetation, so to keep them well hidden. These guys have a, a variety of calls, but primarily the one that people recognize is kind of a dove-like cooing call. And then they also, you know, do like a squawk sound. They do say that least bitterns are probably one of our most elusive marsh birds, secretive marsh birds, just because they don't always reliably call back or to you know respond to the calls that we play on our devices. So um, sometimes they're there and we're just they're just not telling us they're there. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this is, you know, what we've seen so far with the bird atlas, and this is actually kind of encouraging to me because one of the things that we've seen over time, um, we've done surveys in the past, and we've had some grad students do work on these bitterns and then repeat surveys that had been done in the 80s that showed these birds no longer occupying certain places. So um, I'm kind of encouraged by this map and showing that there's a lot of possible places that they are still remaining in Maine. So um, it just shows that we need to, you know, put a lot of effort into trying to find them. Okay, so the next bird is a, one of the herons. So the green heron, also pretty small bird, um, probably the size. So I like to describe them, especially in flight, that they look like a tailless crow. So similar in size, like a crow, they, they look like they don't have a tail um, compared to what you would think a crow looks like flying through the air. Um, but they're also a really, they're a beautiful bird in breeding plumage, which you can see on the right there with the greenish back um, and the head. And then they have the cinnamon color on, their, on, their, on the sides of their face going onto their chest. And then on the left, that's a juvenile. Um, you can tell it's more striped and um, it has some tufts of feathers up on its head, kind of showing that it's, it's still, you know, 
pretty close to, close to after when it fledged. An interesting thing about these guys is they actually will put um, bait down on the water surface to try to um, get fish to come up to the water surface so they can then grab the fish. So they might put like a little piece of a flower on the surface of the water and wait for a fish to try to nibble at it or check it out and then they'll go for the fish. So pretty smart birds. to say before I played their calls, um, you know, it's mostly kind of squawking sounds that they do, but they are recognizable once you kind of hear them over and over again. Um, they also, their habitats are quite different than a lot of the birds I've mentioned so far. They like a more heavily shrubby component and often where I see them is on kind of a riparian corridor, so along a stream. Um, I just feel like they're notorious for me paddling along a stream and they're right ahead of me and then I try to go and pass them and they just flying ahead of me and keep flying ahead of me and I feel like I'm disturbing them but I just want to get around them if they just stay still but um, that's where I typically tend to see them. Um, sometimes they'll nest on the edges of other uh, long-legged wading bird colonies but most often not. They're more in like um, shrubby, tall shrubby areas and not necessarily those um, widespread emergent marshes like we were talking about before. And so here's um, a map so far showing what we've seen with green herons. And this is, I, I think, pretty reflective of what we've known as far as where they occur in Maine. Although um, I'm sure there's more, more spots um, that we could potentially find them in. Um, but they're, they're definitely a neat bird to be able to see uh, in the field. So I thought I'd mention great blue heron, very different bird than um, some of the others in that their nests are pretty visible. Um, anybody who's familiar with them, they nest primarily in trees. They will nest um, on the ground sometimes, but not to my knowledge in Maine. Um, and, you know, they nest in colonies. So often they're noticeable because of that, because you'll see multiple nests in trees, whether they're dead trees or, or live trees. Um, but the reason I wanted to mention them tonight is because it's still, it's a bird that we've been doing a lot of work with the department to understand their population. So we're always on the lookout for new colonies. Um, and their colonies can be large, you know, 100, 200 pairs, but they also can be single nests, so not really a colony. Um, so seeing a stick nest up in a snag, um, you know, it could be multiple things, but um, it has the potential to be uh, a heron nest. So we'd love to know about that. Um, so these guys have a bunch of just, they have a lot of, oops, let me go back. They have a lot of different calls, um, mostly squawking calls, but they also do some calls at their, at their nest where when they greet each other, it sounds almost like um, a howling sound, and then the young make kind of a chattering sound. So I'll play that series here. So between the green blue herons and my dogs barking in the background, you probably don't know which is which, but I apologize for that. But my daughter, I know, probably just got home. So it'll go away in a, in a moment or two. Uh, so this is what, you know, a, um, a snag with multiple nests looks like. All those birds in those nests are young. So the young stay in the nest for anywhere up to between 50 to 80 days, depending on how quickly they can develop and how much food there is. Um, so they get to the size of an adult before they actually fledge. Um, but this is, 
you know, what's been gathered so far with the breeding bird atlas and we, it reflects what I've known, you know, from our 13 years of monitoring so far. Um, so nothing surprising, but I think we actually have learned of some new colonies through this effort, which has been excellent because um, I think a lot of people just assume we already know where the colonies are, but it's, it, that's not true. And colonies do change locations um, and they blink on and off. So, you, you know, you can't assume that we already know about it. So we'd love to, love to hear if you ever find a heron nest. Okay, so now um, this is an interesting one, the Wilson snipe. Um, these guys are actually a shorebird. So pretty different than all the others I've talked about so far. Uh, they're, they're really cool because they do um, these displays where they have some special tail feathers that make this winnowing call as they um, do their aerial display. And, you know, it might remind you of like the woodcock when they do their display. And I've been hearing them lately um, that they produce that sound, I believe, from some of their wing feathers. But these guys produce it from their tail feathers. Um, they'll nest on the ground uh, in the marsh. They like, you know, kind of open marsh habitats with low herbaceous cover. Um, but they'll they'll fly high up into the air and and then do these deep dives that produce this sound going across those feathers. And it's, it's a pretty cool throbbing sound that you'll hear. So a few different calls there in addition to the winnowing. Um, the last one I believe were the, the young, but the middle one is also a sound that you'll hear in the marsh, you know, when they're not, whether they're displaying or not, you'll, you'll hear um, that um, chip, chip uh, note or weeda note that was played. Uh, here's another nice picture of one, um, kind of blending in pretty well with that vegetation there. Um, and this map shows, um, you know, on a lot of those other maps, there was a lot of gray area up in northern Maine and western Maine, but um, the snipe, as you can see, is a little more widespread, and, and we've had a lot more detections up in those areas, so that's, that's great. And what that also means is if people are up there doing surveys and hearing snipe and not hearing something else, that negative data for those other species is still really important. So. Um, even if it's grayed out here, doesn't mean that it's not a valuable data point. Okay, so next I'll talk about some wrens that we find in the marshes. And the one that we survey for is the sedge wren because it's very rare. Um, they like kind of the sedge meadow habitats, but their habitats are somewhat ephem ephemeral and they don't necessarily um, have a high site fidelity. So they tend to move around, which makes finding them and then keeping track of them harder. Um, so we're always interested in, in sedren observations just to know, you know, where they are, what types of habitats they're using, and to make sure, you know, if we can potentially conserve that space for them. Um, the marsh wren is a lot more common, although they're not everywhere. They're not in all marshes, but the commonality between both of these species is they often do what you see here, perch on the vegetation and call from it. And their calls are slightly similar. The sedren is more of like a staccato, whereas the marsh wren I think of as being more bubbly. <laughs> um, the sedren has a shorter bill than the marsh wren um, and a little, it just seems stubbier in general compared to the marsh wren. So I'll first play I believe the Cedron, yeah. Kind of like a machine gun. 
So compared to the marsh wren, which like I said, to me, it's bubbly. And so both of these species build these globular nests that'll be raised up in the vegetation. So, you know, kind of at eye, eye height, um, depending on how tall the vegetation is or how tall you are in your boat. Um, and they build multiple nests in the same area and they're considered dummy nests. So I think it's to evade predators and that kind of thing. Um, but this is a very typical looking nest for a marsh. It's a marsh wren nest, but it's also pretty typical of what a sedge wren nest would look like too. They have a hole in the front of it, but it's otherwise just a completely enclosed um, sphere made out of uh, marsh vegetation. So this is the sedge wren is on the left and you can see we really don't have much in the way of observations of them. And like I said, they are a tough bird to find and to pin down. Uh, even when we do find them. Uh, the marsh wren, a little more widespread, but you know, still limited central Maine to southern Maine, um, kind of like some of our other species that I mentioned tonight. So, so next uh, I wanted to mention the black tern. I think this is the last species I'll be mentioning um, because this is one of our state endangered species that also inhabits a lot of the same places that um, these other birds are found. So uh, we've done a lot of surveys trying to look for more um, black tern sites. We're down to three uh, well-established colonies, but even the numbers within those are going down. Um, so we're, we're constantly trying to see if they're moving around, but um, so far we haven't been successful in finding new spots. Um, <clears throat> but they're a neat tern in that they're freshwater nesting. So unlike all the other terns in Maine. I mean, we do have some terns that nest on uh, freshwater lakes, but these guys really like the hemi marsh where there's lots of emergent vegetation, lots of open water and mud. So they often will build their nests right on the mud. Um, so they're beautiful birds. They kind of have a very lofty flight and their call is very similar to other tern calls. Um, and I'll, I can play that here. They, they actually don't, they primarily eat insects compared to a lot of other terns who eat fish. They'll eat fish, but they're going after dragonflies on the wing primarily. And this is kind of what their nests, their nests could look like. So up in the upper left there, that's a very typical nest kind of surrounded by water, just kind of on this floating mud um, in the water. It's, it's, there's not much structure there holding it up. Um, and sometimes they'll be on the edge of the more emergent vegetation where there's actually a little more structure there. Um, but this map kind of shows these are our colonies that we know about, the ones with the sea for confirmed, and then it's kind of neat that we've had some other observations, um, especially this one up here with the possible. So um, it would be great to be able to find some, some other areas these guys are nesting. Okay, so now I'm just going to move on to um, a little bit about the surveys, the special species surveys that we do for all those birds that I mentioned. Um, and just kind of explain what that entails and how people could potentially get involved if, if it's something they're interested in. So um, this, I don't know if this is covering this for you, but it says we want you for the Maine Marsh Bird Surveys. Um, so this is all, um, these special surveys are being done through the Maine Bird Atlas. Um, and we're looking for volunteers to help us go out and survey for these elusive species in these wetland habitats. And we've actually selected marshes um, kind of at random throughout the state, mainly so that we can get a good representation of um, the various types of marshes. So you've got shrubby marshes, you've got more um, emergent marshes, you have marshes on the edges of lakes, you have marshes 
that are more kind of in the middle of a boggy area. So we've, there's a whole range of types of marshes and we've kind of sampled all of them, come up with 200 sites around the state that we're trying to complete by the end of this year. And I hear we have somewhere between 50 to 60 marshes left. Um, I do a few each year where you go out to those sites, you go to one point sometimes, sometimes you travel along a stream and you go to multiple points, every marsh is different. And you play those calls that I mentioned, and then you listen for them to call back and you write that down on your data sheet. So right now on the uh, main Natural History Observatory website, we have kind of a, a place where you can learn about these marsh bird surveys. Um, and there's a map where you can choose the sites that you might want to do. So <clears throat> for each of these dots on the map, you can click on it and it'll tell you, it'll, well, you can zoom in, first of all, and see where you're, where you're going. But you can click on it, it'll tell you how many points. So I think my next one, I think I have a marsh in the next slide that I clicked on this point right here, kind of north, uh, northwest of Sebago Lake. <clears throat> and this is the info that you come up with first, where it just says, you know, how big that wetland is. It's 27 acres, site number 212. Is there landowner permission there? No, but this one in particular is owned by a local land trust. So um, one thing that we need to do in order to do any surveys is we like to get landowner permission. So that's just some useful information. But on this marsh, there's two points. So these little red dots are the points where we are hoping when somebody surveys this marsh, they will go out to each of these points, play the series of calls I mentioned, and listen for birds to call back. Um, so in a nutshell, these surveys, you first select a marsh from that map that I mentioned. Um, we'll get you um, the field protocol, which explains, you know, the timing of the surveys. Um, we'll give you the, the calls to put on an MP3 player to, to broadcast. Um, the surveys basically are done over th the course of three visits to the, that same wetland um, between May 15th and June 30th. Um, and that's to space out so that, like I mentioned earlier, some birds are more prone to calling at different times throughout the season. So it's really good to go multiple times um, to make sure you didn't miss something. And also, if you get a bird on two of those surveys, that's an automatic um, probable breeding, I believe. So um, that's really important to do those repeats. Um, so you basically go out to those points, play the calls, listen for the call back and record what you see in here. The things that you would need to be a part of this would be um, a portable device, like this little mini um, MP3 player here. This is a portable speaker. This is one of those waterproof ones you can put in the shower. Um, the speaker just has to Oh, be able to broadcast at a certain decibel level. I think it's 80 to 90 decibels at one meter away is the, the level. We have all this written down, but so this is just me going over it pretty quickly. Uh, you need a life jacket, even if you're on foot. So some of these sites, you can walk out to that point. You don't have to go um, by kayak or canoe, but we still want people wearing life jackets because if you're in water, and you sudden or in a moist area and you suddenly step into a big hole or you know something that you weren't expecting um, there's always a risk so we want people to be safe it's helpful if you have a gps unit to help navigate to your points um, and depending on the site you might need a canoe or kayak the things that are provided by the the bird atlas are you get um, a fancy map that shows your points along whatever area it is. This is one that I did last year, um, actually two years ago, I believe. So I had two points over here, and then I had to go around and do these three point or four points over here. So I could kayak both of those sites, but I had to do it from two separate areas. Uh, we, there's a survey protocol handbook, um, data sheets, and then, like I mentioned, we would provide those audio files similar to what you heard tonight in a series with 
silence in between each so that you have time to listen for the birds to call back. Uh, before you go out and survey, you decide, do I need a kayak or canoe? Or am I gonna walk there? How am I gonna get there? What roads am I gonna take? We need everybody to get landowner permission. We can often help with that. Um, and then setting your own schedule, you know, figuring out there's three different windows for surveys. There's May 15th to May 30th, June 1st to the 15th, and June 16th to the 30th. So um, figuring out when you're gonna survey. Uh, weather dictates some of that. Um, yeah, and so, and of course your own schedule. Some additional tips for these surveys are, um, one is to become familiar with your frog calls too. So I mentioned earlier, some of those one notes that you might hear, sometimes they also sound like a one note of a frog call. So um, we, the Maine Natural History Observatory has this great website um, bookmarked on there where you can listen to those calls and get familiar with the frogs and um, that we have around us. Um, and also, you know, no birds, you don't detect any birds at your sites, that's not a problem. Negative data or knowing where the birds aren't is just as important as knowing where they are. So um, all of this is feeding into us being able to say um, where these birds most likely are in the state and how many are likely out there. So I thought it'd be just fun to show you how similar sometimes these aren't these aren't really similar, but they're as close as I could find on recordings. But <clears throat> so, you know, like a Sora one, sometimes they can sound like a note of a spring peeper. So I'm gonna play two calls um, and you can see which one you think it is. This is not the quiz, it's just, just to listen. <clears throat> so that is one call. That's either a frog or a bird. And that's either a frog or a bird. So the first one was the frog, second was the bird. But, um, you know, and sometimes it's even more subtle than that. So here's another situation where uh, maybe it's a yellow rail, maybe it's a mink frog. So the first one, they're kind of like these, these tapping or, or quick notes, right, that aren't very high pitched. First one was the mink frog, second one was the yellow rail. So it just gives you a feel for how sometimes these things could get confusing, but it's just good to be aware of that and to know there's these possibilities. All right, so we are at the end and um, we can do the guess the marsh bird game that I have for everybody. What do you think, Adrian? Um, yeah, I think it's a, a, a great idea. Um, we tend to um, keep going. We'll probably stay on for another half hour. So we'll call it quits at eight just to give people time to ask questions um, as well. There's been a lot of great conversation in the chat. So Logan can keep that organized, but um, this is just for fun. But I do have, so I, I actually, we were trying to figure out a way to make this fair because we can't see hands raised and people can't type as fast. So I, I've even thought of a different thing throughout the presentation. If you know the answer, what we're gonna do is everybody, you can just put your fingers on the M and the E and then you hit enter. So you're just gonna type me, and then we'll call on you and you can unmute yourself or you can type your answer in the chat. Um, so definitely chime in because if the first person gets it wrong, you might get a second chance. We'll call on the first people as we see the me's pop up in the chat. That's probably easier. I initially was gonna do initials, but that may be too many letters. So you can just type in me and hit enter and we'll call on you. And you get your choice. Should you guess the marsh bird correctly and win, you will get your choice of a not available in stores <laughs> uh, coffee mug, tote bag, 
or ball cap with the Maine Bird Atlas Chickadee State of Maine logo uh, on it and featured. So um, yeah, let's try that. So get your fingers ready on your me keys <laughs> and hit, just type in me and hit enter and we'll call on um, people until we get a correct answer. <laughs> Ian. Okay, you're up. Right, ready? Okay, so <laughs> it'll first say number one and then it'll play the call. So hopefully, hold on. What's going on? There we go. Okay, you can't type the birds. Don't type the birds in the chat until we call on you. And we're going for the specific marsh species, not the red winged blackbirds and the wrens. But I'm, right. I'm really thrilled to see we have such in tune volunteers. Okay, so Kate, you're, you, you, you got me first. What is it? Least bittern. Yay. <laughs> Great job, <Okay>. Kate. <laughs> Thanks, Wait, I need to make. I need to make a list for myself. Okay. okay. All right, I'll, moving I'll, on. I'll just get through and then I'll, I'll, I'll message each of you to ask what you would like. Okay, there's only five, so. And once you've won, just stay out of it. Let other people have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Okay, ready? My clicker is not working. There we go. You're muted, Adrian. Sorry, I think Steve came in first on that one. Sounds like a Sora. Correct. <laughs> Very nice. I tried to do just little snippets because sometimes, you know, you don't hear the range of all the different calls they do. You just hear one thing. So good job. Okay, and you it got could that be here? like. It's not like Jeopardy. So if you buzz in and you guess wrong, you're not going to lose points. So <laughs> right. you can have a moment to like think about it before you. <laughs> right. Okay. okay, next one. Ian was fast on that one. So. Oh, I didn't mean for that to go on forever. There we go. <laughs> That was a good one. Well <laughs> done, Ian. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, wait. I, <laughs> oh, it was Steve. Okay. This is how well my brain's working. I was making notes of the winners. And instead of your name, Steve, I wrote down Sora. <laughs> there we go. And I'm like, okay, so Ian's the third winner. All right. Okay, number, number four. four. <laughs> Oh, Elizabeth, it's all you. Nice. Very, Very good. Nice. Yeah. Good job. Okay. I guess, and I did just realize like there's one component of unfairness here that we can't really account for if people have faster internet than others oh, yeah. <laughs> but we're trying to make it as fair as possible so apologies if you're getting it in there but it's not popping up on our screens as fast yeah. but okay okay last one there we go <laughs> All right, Sean. Okay, what is the, that is the common gallinule. Very good. I love the Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah, we should have had that. What is common gallinule? Perfect. 
<laughs> All right, that worked Hi. out really well. Yeah. We had, uh, yeah, there was a lot of people chiming in. So, um, <laughs> super. Um, so the five of you that won, do not leave this Zoom before I get information from you, please. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll let Logan take it over from here. And I'll just add, so we, again, this is the last year of the Atlas. Um, like Danielle said, we have 50 to 60 marshes that we still need these specific surveys to be done on. And they... They were specifically chosen. I know there's tons of marshes out there and a lot of you are familiar with marshes and um, we, all data is valuable, um, but um, we really need these specific ones to be done so that we can utilize them in this modeling framework because obviously we can't get to every marsh in the state of Maine, but by sampling, in a structured way that we have set up, we can use that data to tell us stories about what we would expect around the rest of the state. So, um, and the great thing about these surveys, even if, if you felt really overwhelmed by the quiz or you had ones wrong, I'm actually way out of practice and I had one wrong in my head and I'm not, so I'll own up to it. The great thing about the marsh surveys is that we give you a cheat sheet. Like you don't have to go out feeling like you're a marsh bird expert or even a bird expert at all. Um, some of them, some of the sites may require you to be able to really kind of navigate off trail and use map and compass and GPS. Other sites, you can just stand on the side of a road and survey. So don't be intimidated. You can zoom in on that map, find sites that work for you. We really want to get people signed up for the remaining um, 60 marshes that are out there. It's um, really fun. And as Kate posted in the chat, um, it, it's led her to some really cool places in Maine that she never would have gone. And even when there weren't marsh birds, it was such a neat experience to immerse yourself in a new isolated environment in some cases. Um, so again, we give you the cheat sheet. You can kind of learn as you go while you're out there. Um, the biggest thing is just that you are have an interest and excitement and you're careful with what observations you make and with being safe. Um, that's a big thing as Danielle mentioned. So um, feel free to reach out to Glenn or Logan um, I'll let you guys talk from there, but I just wanted to don't get discouraged if you didn't know the quiz birds. That was just for funsies. So, yeah. And the other thing, you know, because part of this is playback, you're going to hear these calls over and over and over, over again, again, and they're going to get ingrained in your mind. You'll know what, you know, you'll know the order that they're in. And so even if you hear one and you're like, I know that's one of them, you can say, I'm going to go listen to, to the call again and see if that's the right one. So um, that's kind of teaching you as you go. I mean, that's how I learned them originally. So I've been doing it for the three years that we've had these going on. And up until this last year, I was almost ready to tell Danielle, I told, I mentioned to her, I was like, I was almost ready to just fire myself from these surveys because I ended up with all of these sites that I didn't have marsh birds. And I thought that it was just because I was so bad at hearing them and identifying them. And then, and so I thought, I was like, Danielle, I don't think I'm cut out for marsh birds. <laughs> but then I, I ended up one of my five marshes that I did over the last three years last year, finally had birds in it. And it made me feel less crazy. So they're secretive, they're you know, you saw those maps, they're not everywhere. So even if you do the surveys for us, don't get discouraged if you don't hear them, as Danielle mentioned. Um, knowing where they aren't is very valuable for us. And, and then also any other birds that you do know while you're out there, that's great information for us. So I tend to talk too much, so I'm gonna be quiet now. Um, <laughs> we'll let you get to questions. <laughs> All I right. can stop sharing maybe. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to. A little more conversational there. Yeah, um, just building off of what Adrian was just saying too, it's you, you really don't know what to expect each time you go out. 
Um, and as a, a, a quick anecdote to get you even more excited about it, I, I went out to a marsh last year that, you know, it was a fairly small marsh. It was near a developed area, but you know, you go into it just hoping to find whatever you find. There, there are lots of marsh wrens and swamp sparrow. And uh, right after I started the survey, I had a Virginia rail start vocalizing. And then, you know, a few minutes later, then there was a Sora. So I had two of the, the targets. And then I had American Bittern appear and actually flew right out in front of me. And, uh, and then uh, right towards the end of the, the uh, survey, I had a least Bittern, which was really, really exciting. So yeah, four of the targets all in one, one survey. So, and that was at a, at a site that I was easily able to walk into and uh, you know, right near right near a town. So, if you see a marsh that's that's nearby and you're thinking about it, you should definitely go for it. But all right, we'll jump into the questions here. All right, so are nursery nests and asynchronous hatching unique to Sora, or is that something that a lot of marsh birds do? Uh, I think a lot of the rails do that. Um, it's not just unique to Sora. I, I'm pretty sure the Virginia rail does it as well. And I'm, I'm guessing the yellow rail does, but I'm not, I'm not positive, but it's not just unique to the Sora for sure. Sure. And then can you expand upon what a, what a nursery nest really is, what, what their function is? I think it's just like a place for them to stage their young. So like I mentioned, um, so they, they don't hatch all at the same time. So there's, some young that are up and running about, right? And then there's eggs that still need to hatch. So I think, you know, it's just like places for them to be without being right on top of the eggs, I'm guessing, so. Sure. <laughs> All right. And is that something that they use for, you know, a, a period of time or is it just like a, like a, a stopover? Um, do they, they continue to use it throughout the breeding season? I'm not sure, but I would think it's just for a short period in the beginning after they first hatched. And then uh, once they're, once they've all hatched and once they're more, you know, mobile and able to get around a little easier, then I doubt they use them. But I'm don't quote me on that. I'm not positive. <laughs> all right. So this this question I think was specifically uh, talking about great blue heron, but it it may apply to to others that we've talked about as well. So do you think the absence of sightings in uh, northern and central Maine are due to fewer birds, or do you think it's fewer birders? Yeah, so that's a good question. And that's why, you know, some of those maps, it does strike me as that. But then, you know, I mentioned you see the snipe map, and there's all sorts of snipe in some of those areas where we're not seeing some of the others. And so there's birders out there, obviously, detecting the snipe. So, you know, unless they don't know how to identify the others, which I'm pretty doubtful of, um, you'd think they'd be marking those down. Um, the other thing with the great blue heron specifically, we've done aerial surveys back in 2015. We did a pretty big survey where we sampled random plots and all this stuff. And um, we did not find much in the way of new sites in that northern area, you know, the, the area that's kind of absent of all those observations. <clears throat> and even down east, there was kind of a, um, a lack of those. So um, even given that survey effort, effort, we weren't finding them. It's not the perfect survey effort, but you know, it's, it's in addition to having people out on the landscape, so. This is my own question kind of building on that. Is that something that's, that you've seen change over time as, as heron populations have changed? Has their distribution in the state changed much? We have lost, it seems like we've lost some, <clears throat> larger colonies from some of those more northern and western um, western Maine areas as well as down east. Um, we do have historic sites in our records and none of like a lot of those are not active anymore and we have yet to find where you know if the birds moved we have yet to find those sites. So um, it's a little trickier in northern and western Maine because a lot of those sites were originally um, live tree stands. So like <clears throat> live white pine stands or whatever, they're harder to detect even during aerial surveys. Um, so, you know, we could very well be missing stuff because of that. 
Um, and a lot of those, um, because they're active timberlands and they're, you know, there's doing active logging, a lot of those sites either were cut over, not intentionally, but, you know, changes happen over time. So those sites might no longer be there. But the big question is, where did the birds go? Uh, are they still out on the landscape or is it actually a decline? Sure. <clears throat> All right. This question was answered in the chat, but we'll go over it again just for those folks that weren't watching the chat. So when you said that sedrens tend to move around a lot, were you saying that they move um, from year to year or is it uh, within a single year that they tend to be moving? I think I think it's more year to year, um, but I have not had, you know, they're one of the, the species I know the least about <laughs> out of all the ones I talked about tonight um, because I have not had the opportunity to interact with them because I can never find them. So, um, but what I've kind of read and gleaned from others is that um, they're just, they don't have high site fidelity. So they might be there one year, but then not the next year and things change. Some of these sites um, are like scoured by ice. So they change over time. Um, Adrian, I see you nodding your head. If you want to add anything, please, please do. But I have a limited knowledge of sedrens. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, moving on to black terns. So do uh, black terns tend to build up their nests with water level changes as well? No, they don't. Um, so they, they can get flooded for sure. Um, they do have the ability, I think a lot of wetland birds have some adaptation in the sense of their, their eggshells can withstand a certain degree of inundation, um, you know, like temporary and then it subsides and the, the eggs are still viable. So they, they have that ability to some degree, but, um, but they don't build up their nests. Um, like that one that you saw on the mud there, is very typical and sometimes we've come across those nests and it looks like a very light coating of mud over the eggs which is an indication that the water level rose you know it's kind of like mucky water and then it, it subsided and so um, sometimes when that happens it, it does not um, it's not successful it ends up failing. Sure. All right another black turn question you know if they tend to migrate with common terns or, or other terns? Um, I don't, I don't know that. Um, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, but there's actually a lot of work. There's work being done right now with different types of um, transmitters and um, geolocators and stuff to, to learn more about their migration because it's something that we, we don't know a lot about yet. But um, knowing their habits, so they, uh, one of the hotspots that they go down to is like the Panama area and um, they're, they're on the ocean in the winter. Um, so I'm not sure how much they're intermingling with other terns, honestly, um, they, and whether- there, there is a black tern uh, that a, may, it might just be a single one, but trying to nest in a common Arctic tern colony off the coast. Yes, yeah, and we've, I think we've bit. seen it in Northern Maine as well, um, in St. Agat, but um, that's pretty atypical, right? I mean, it's like a, it's a, a rare thing, but sure. yeah, the short answer is I don't know, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you had mentioned that there were other terns that nested um, on freshwater lakes. What, what species are those? That we see in oh, Maine. I was thinking of common terns. Mm -hmm. So we do have common terns that nest kind of on like rocky outcrops or islands within some of our more northern lakes. Um, and actually there's this kind of sandy island that some people might be familiar with on, I think it's Long Lake in St. Agat where we have mm -hmm. common terns and every now and then I think that's where we have the black tern end up. Um, but a lot of those sites are very susceptible to water level changes and those lakes sometimes fluctuate a lot. So in one year, there may be a lot of nesting habitat available and another year might not be. Sure. Okay. 
All right, there was a question about um, whether or not this, this uh, was being recorded and would be available. And I can just answer that. Yes, it, it is being recorded and we're gonna post it up. Um, Glenn, are we putting it on the MNHO YouTube page? Yeah, and yep. we'll, we'll send a link to everyone who signed up for Perfect. this presentation as well. Okay, great. All right. Um, yeah, we had that comment from Kate, just that going out to these, uh, do these surveys has brought her to a lot of great places. And I would definitely echo that. Um, you end up seeing all sorts of different parts of the state and getting to, I mean, depending on, on the marsh, getting to uh, go into some really interesting habitat. Um, so let's see here. We had another question. So, in my, I was oh, yes, just gonna say, in my opinion, it's also the best time of day to be out birding is yeah, definitely. right at sunrise. It's it's a pretty remarkable time. Yeah, it really is. You you hear a lot of stuff active and you don't hear a lot of the other, you know, uh, uh, environmental sounds that can compete for that. So it's it's really awesome. Um, so there were questions. So we had a question. I assume that the windows for surveys is related to sunrise. Um, so they actually can be done at uh, sunset or at sunrise. You've got the option, although there's a larger window for the um, sunrise surveys. I have that right, right? Yeah. Okay. And Glenn, did you happen to see any more questions before? I haven't been monitoring new questions as I've been reviewing. There, there's one, um, although snipe are more likely to be seen than other species, so wouldn't you expect them more often, particularly if observation is during the daylight? Um, so yeah, it's, I guess snipe can be heard. You don't, you don't necessarily need to be hear them at night. I've, I've picked them up during the day, although they certainly increase at night. Right. Yeah, I've seen I've seen quite a few snipe um, during the day as well, just flushed while I'm paddling through a marsh. Um, yeah. And I've actually had them, uh, you know, doing the more elaborate flights during the day too. I, I hear it more at night, but I've I've heard it, you know, in late morning as well. And there was there was a question too about um, the timing of uh, yellow rail vocalizations, and they're typically thought of as nocturnal, but I did, I just pointed out that the one yellow rail observation, or I guess we have two technically, but from the same site, um, were around noon and in the after, late afternoon. So I guess you gotta be vigilant all the time, which is a good <laughs> lesson. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, all right, we had a question, what's better sunrise or sunset at saltwater? or sunrise or sunset in freshwater, in your opinion? Glenn says saltwater. <laughs> you mean as far as marsh birds or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it may be a general question. I think diversity wise, as far as the species I talked about today, you know, more of them are found in the on the freshwater wetlands. So there's you know, a chance to see more of those species maybe in, in the same space in a freshwater wetland than in the salt marsh, but. Sure. Yeah, no, definitely for sightings, freshwater, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and, you know, I'll add too, I mean, obviously it depends on your, your schedule, but doing uh, the surveys uh, at sunrise is great too, because it just, it does give you that much more time to, to do your surveys, but also when you're done, you've got the whole day ahead of you. You're not trying to get yourself out of a marsh at, you know, <laughs> after dusk. <laughs> yes. So logistically, it's it's better too. Absolutely. And uh, the only requirement there is that because there are three visits that you have to make, um, one in May and then two different times in June, um, that um, you, whatever time you set up for May, whether it's sunrise or sunset, you just have to be consistent for your June visits. Um, but they, they can 
be equally good for getting the birds, but all right. of the other um, reasons that uh, morning we mentioned morning is a little better. Um, and Dan just put a very good comment in the chat too that the wind can also pick up later mm -hmm. in the day, so that becomes a factor in hearing for sure. birds. Um, yeah, Ian, the um, I'll let you, um, Glenn, address Ian's question about getting involved. Yeah, no, I, I just direct messaged him. Oh, perfect. I'm happy okay. to stay on and get you set up. Um, and just for the sake of the recording, yeah, just for the <laughs> sake of the recording, I will mention um, the one other thing that we do have a small number of speakers we can provide. We have about 10, so it's a first come, first serve basis. Um, I shouldn't even say 10 because a couple of them are already spoken for um, for this year. But if you are lacking an adequate speaker and there is a, there is kind of a, a requirement, not just any, all speakers are not created equal. So um, it, that the specifics for what we would need are in the protocol and how to go about that. But that's one other thing that it can be available if needed um, to volunteers. And do we have like some suggested speakers if people wanted to buy them? Do we have that somewhere that we could share? Like what we've purchased, they could go on Amazon and <clears throat> get them. That's a good, them. I don't, did we put, I mean, we put the specs for what the speakers should have in the protocol, but I don't know if we listed what we use ourselves, but you can always, when you, when you email Glenn to, um, sign up for a survey block he can give you that information yeah mainbirdatlas at gmail.com gets to us we're happy to answer questions um, we use the goal zero rock out two speakers um, but they don't make those anymore although you can still buy them mm -hmm. on ebay and things like that i like them because they're they're wired if you like wireless things they make a, a modern one that's wireless Um, we also use, um, nope, not going to think of it. The, I'm trying to think of the ones that I bought for our technicians. It's a waterproof speaker. Um, it's a small round one, complete brain fart on the brand. It's a common brand. I got them at Walmart and they have like a carabiner clip. Do you remember Danielle? Okay. No. Because the one the I use is, yeah, the one I use I've had forever, so. Yeah. Um, but we basically, <laughs> the speaker, it just needs to broadcast at a certain decibel level, and we provide all that information. Um, and as far as we're kind of at our limit, I think we got to all the questions, which is great. Um, so let's... Um, uh, we can stop recording, and I have everybody's prize information except you, Elizabeth, but I see you're still